Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Dan Curran. Dan is the, a partner in an organization by the name of Chapters. They are a platform that simplifies the book writing and publishing process. Welcome to today's podcast episode, Dan. Thank you for having me. Dan, in my research, um, in preparing to talk with you, it mentions that you have had obstacles starting businesses, getting businesses going. You learned an awful lot about business. And something that stood out is you have a lot of experience in storytelling in the areas of finance and business in general. Tell us what you mean by uh, storytelling. Well, I, you would classify me as a serial entrepreneur, and the swim lane that I've existed in has been marketing. And I have spent a lot of time with you know, iconic large brands. So Anheuser-Busch, Hanes Apparel, Wells Fargo. Um, and, and part of that was a lot of financial uh, companies. And I have seen the spectrum of B2B and B2C brands on how they communicate, uh, how they position themselves, uh, how that has worked out really well. And I've seen it not work out uh, so well. So uh, it's given me a great perspective. And then, of course, I have to brand my companies that I've started and built and a few that we've sold. So um, storytelling is in this busy, busy world. Um, the authentic self and company is kind of an easy go to, sometimes scary, but it's the most authentic and usually works out pretty well if you, you know, stick to who you are and what you know about. So it says you're biggest learning experiences were as an entrepreneur, perhaps um, in the tech field, digital content space. Could you explain that for us? Yeah. So the arc of my career as an entrepreneur has seen really this onslaught of content. It became certainly the, ons uh, the onset of user-generated content um, and social allowed it to be democratized. So not only do you have brands pushing out content, you have, you know, regular people like you and I pushing out content. So it's crowded. And so call it what you will, content pollution. Uh, that train has has not, you know, stopped and it's only the velocity is only increased. So that's the world we live in is one that, uh, you know, so many images and messages come at us and our brains really haven't changed. So how consumers, how we as humans, uh, you know, accept this into our psyche and what we do with it. It's been really fascinating the last 15, 20 years. So you, as you've seen all these technology changes take place, it's become more and more complicated as far as the marketing aspect of a business, the sales aspect, et cetera. And a big part of that is people, I believe, believe they have to develop a community. Where do you see the place of community in running and driving a thriving marketing aspect of the business? Well, you know, that's, that's really interesting. <clears throat> um, so I'll be maybe contrarian on this. Yes, you need to build a community, I guess. If I had to default to a yes or no, I would say yes, but not all communities are the same. You know, if you're selling a uh, cosmetic product to young women that that's a certain kind of community if i if i'm an accountant and i have a little accounting office what is my community you know it's it's yes there's a community you want great word of mouth but it's the context what that looks like is very very different so um no size you know there's no one size fits all and i think um if you hear anyone over index like you have to have a community i would i would always be suspicious because it's contextual to what, you know, your business is, is doing. And, and sometimes some of these social channels are not right for you. Sometimes a lot of content is right. Sometimes it's not right. So it's all contextual to certain industries, I think. Okay. And what, what inspired you to start chapters? 
So I had a company that was um, primarily doing content, what you would call B2B content. And ours was pretty niche. We, this is in the, the you know, 2018 to 22, um, doing white papers, blogs, primarily for the uh, healthcare space and technology space. So very geeky, dense content. So we interviewed a lot of subject matter experts for big healthcare companies, let's say. And when ChatGBT, November 30th of 2022, um, to be specific, when OpenAI launched that, um, and we all started, it didn't come out with the user manual, we're all figuring it out. I knew that it would have an effect uh, on writers and on content. Um, but we looked at it differently. We were interviewing people and we thought, why don't we, we can't plagiarize. We, we attribution editorial rigor is so important. What if we reverse engineered it and we did these interviews with these subject matter experts and we um, organized the content with AI? We found gaps in the content with AI and we asked AI if we're missing anything or do you have any suggestions? All the while keeping the integrity the same. And we brought that over to nonfiction publishing. So that's what Chapters does. It helps nonfiction authors, entrepreneurs, executives, thought leaders, um, use AI in a much more authentic way. There's no plagiarism, but we're using AI to pull it out of your brain, to grab that wisdom. And if you're not a great typer, you don't have great motor skills, AI doesn't care. It can take in audio, video. And so that's what Chapters does. We're opening, we're democratizing it, um, being, becoming an author by using AI. And then we use AI to organize and to find gaps. And it, it's kind of an assistant, a co, a, a co pilot. So we're, our purpose is to allow more people to become authors and share their wisdom, their unique perspectives, whether they're going to have one book or they're going to have hundreds of books or thousands, just the opportunity to capture uh, their wisdom. A lot of people, when they think of writing a book, they think of an overwhelming task that'll take several lifetimes to do. So what's the problem that you solve for individuals that want to be able to get a book published or some other aspect of publishing, um, what their thoughts are or experiences. Well, I'll use a, I'll, I'll start this way and say, you know, my dad passed away. Um, and when he passed away, it was at a time there was no Google and, uh, there was no, uh, easy way to capture his wisdom. And really there's no record of his perspective, how he handled conflict, how he, what he thought about politics, what he thought about this or that. And so when I say the word democratization, I really mean that. I, th I, think, I think the perception of writing a book is three years, arduous. Um, and I'm not talking about people who are just gifted storytellers, but people who are very wise that like to tell their story. But like you say, it's very stressful. And so with, with um, chapters, you know, I wish I would have had this for my dad because all you have to do is speak. And we will capture it via audio or if, if you want to do it video. And we do this over so many weeks. So to answer your question, we, re we remove all that stress. So actually, when people are working with us, they love it. And we, we have humans involved. There's editors and we're transcribing all of this. Um, people who are really wise that aren't inclined to write a book are all of a sudden saying, wow, this is a third of the time, a third of the money. And I really want to capture my my unique perspective, my life experiences, my wisdom. So it's it's that's our number one mission is to relieve the stress. Just because you don't have the fine motor skills, typing doesn't mean you don't have a lot of wisdom to share. And we want to capture that. If I wanted to write a book with your organization, what's the onboarding process or how does how would I get started in doing that? Super easy. The most complicated part is what I've been talking to you about. Uh, the the onboarding and the actual starting with chapters is very easy. Starts with a kickoff call. We're, we are recording that kickoff call. We are asking you the questions you would think we would ask. Um, what do you want to write about? Who's it for? What's the tone and tenor? What other books do you, you know, inspire you, the, the style of those books? And then it's an iterative process over about 10 weeks of these interviews. And we have it automated now that it doesn't even have to have an editor or a person on our side. You can just, we send you a reminder and you just use your phone or computer and, and each week uh, ask, uh, answer questions. 
And based on those answers, we use AI to contextualize additional questions uh, based on what you shared. So let's say you had a partnership that did not go great, or you scaled a bunch of companies through uh, M&A. It would pick up on that and start asking you more questions about that. So we front load it. So over 10 weeks, these interviews, we then have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 words, 50,000 words, typical book that you're reading. Um, and then you're working with an editor to, to start massaging that, making sure that it's your voice and has the intent that you want. So very, very simple. And I'll say quickly, a typical book to write, especially if you use a ghost writer, nine months to two or three years, um, hundreds <clears throat> of hours. Uh, ours is, you know, much less than that. So we're just accelerating that process. So using AI and the, the workflow process that you put in place as a differentiator, what else would differentiate you from an, or an organization that wants to write and edit books? Well, the, the star of the show is not AI, believe it or not. That accelerates it. It gathers. It's a, it captures uh, your and organizes quite quite well, but the real star of the show are editors. And I learned this in other businesses that I had. The editors are, I call them kind of adults in the room. They've seen a few things. Uh, the ones we have have bestsellers under their belt. So if you have more of a how-to book or a big idea book, like a Simon Sinek on why, or it's a memoir, they will be able to um, take you down the right path because those are all very different types of story arcs. So they had that experience. They're also capable of cap capturing magic. So on a random conversation during this 10 to 12 weeks that they're working with you, they'll really dig. Maybe there's something we had a, we have an author right now who's a doctor and has this amazing story. Uh, but he, when he was in college, he did improv. He was, he's a funny guy and he, but he had to give it up because he had to go to medical school, didn't not enough hours in the day, but she picked up on it. And she goes, Oh, you're a funny guy. Well, let's, it, it changed the narrative of the book. It still had the texture and the depth, but now she infused the, she brought out the humor of, of the author. So editors are really, really key to the process. So we, we think, you know, human plus uh, AI is, is just a, a wonderful marriage. So an individual who is actually going out to, write their thoughts, their narrative, their story with your organization. There's personalization in being guided along. You're not there by yourself, correct? Correct. There's absolutely that. Again, the editor is, is you know, someone, they have a choice, quite frankly, if they're going down a path similar to ours, they can go hire a ghost writer, um, which is amazing ghost writers, but it's kind of a forced marriage and it's usually many, many months together. There can be fatigue. There might not be alignment. Um, editor, it's it's an X factor. It has they're they're there for business. They're there for camaraderie to some degree, but they just have so much wisdom on what they've seen. Really great books, you know, accomplish that usually or all the time. The authors are very happy to not be the alpha in the relationship, but but let the editor be the alpha, and then this. The author can be just be transparent and vulnerable and share their wisdom. So it's it's a great combination. What were some of the challenges that you faced in uh, putting together and building chapters? Well, like any business, uh, there's all kinds of challenges. You know, from getting the right staff members. Um, AI is is a is a new. Uh, well, working with the large language models, uh, again, there's no guidebooks to some degree. So we're kind of building the train and driving the train at the same time. Um, you know, one area working with authors and primarily right now, we're working with executives, entrepreneurs um, on their books. I wouldn't call it a problem, but a surprise is imposter syndrome. Even again, really successful, even super high net worth people of real stature, um, when they're in this process, especially towards the end, they can they can start feeling, "Am I worthy to put this book out?" And uh, I I didn't go in with any skills of psychology, but I sure enjoy, you know, helping them, and our staff does too. That to absolutely everyone should share their their wisdom and who they are. Everyone has a story to tell. Were you surprised when you saw some well accomplished people having imposter syndrome? Jaw dropping. 
Okay. And, and them entrusting me or having that conversation with me. Um, you know, there's certain industries like healthcare, I would say, even we, we help uh, financial advisors, people in the finance sector. There is compliance issues too. So there's a little, there's also that. So we're really our in- editorial integrity and just attribution, all these things really have to be buttoned up like any book. So we, we help them do that. So once they start saying statistics and, and using third-party data, you know, we're there to really, sometimes they get a little bit nervous. So we're, we're like, if, you know, if you have this data, that's great, but we're going to double check it. And so, you know, it's, it's um, you know, there's a lot to think about uh, when writing a book, but fortunately we take most of that load off of, off of the author. Do you find individuals when they come and they start talking to you, they might have a fear of running out of content. I don't know if I have enough ideas to really put a good book together. Again, the editor plays a, a role. I've only seen that once, uh, you know, since we've been doing this, where we did go back to the author and said, hey, why don't we revisit this in six months? Why don't Here's a couple exercises. Why don't you think about it? Uh, usually, um, that is the opposite problem. We have a too high of a word count. We got to pull back. So, you know, that it's, I don't know about you. The smartest people I know, an uncle, my neighbor, a mentor, doesn't have a book. So a lot of people have books. They just are good at getting book deals and, and writing and feel pretty strong. You know, that's their that's their lot in life. But a lot of people, if you have a big plumbing company, if you're a doctor or, you know, whatever industry you come from, you might be very wise, but, um, and you have a lot in your head and a lot to say, but um, the intimidation of publishing, the gatekeepers, that's, that's kind of what we're here to wipe away. So we're, the user experience is really important. Just no friction, letting you just be who you are. And, and the great thing I'll just add with AI, if you do have, some people come to us with a partial manuscript. Some people come to us with charts or processes that they've created that can all go in the large language model uh, that we've created. This vessel it doesn't know the rest of the world. It's just your own vessel. So again, it's an easy um, capture of all that information. So a lot of people come, they, they have, maybe it's on sheets of paper or napkins, but we just grab that and put it, put it in their uh, container, so to speak. You started chapters with a partner, correct? Yes. Take us back to the beginning when the ideas just started incubating between the two of you. What was that experience like? How did it come about? Um, what was that whole idea generation and refining the idea for chapters like? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's a great story. It's, um, I'm part, you know, these, these YPO, EO organizations. So uh, I've been a long time member of EO and I was in a uh, kind of a virtual EO group. So, uh, I'm sure most of you people know about EO, but it's a worldwide organization of founders. And uh, we we meet monthly. I'm in this one particular forum group, and there's 10 of us. And I had a forum mate. He lived in Arizona. And we knew each other for you know years and never thought about starting a business. And then just on a random Tuesday, I had a back of the napkin idea over Zoom I was telling him about. And he said, hey, why don't you look at my screen? I looked up and he had the same idea, but he had the tech side. I had more of the brand positioning side and it was serendipity. Um, and so that's how we started. So we might've broken all the rules. Uh, we didn't know each other for a decade, knew each other for a couple of years. I uh, only saw each other personally a few times, um, but we, we knew each other and built up trust. And then we also knew we had to move fast that, um, you know, we had to plan our flag for this particular business model quickly. So we we both had Moxie. We both kind of self-funded the initial um, platform. And we also have been in business for a while. So we both knew we needed validation to do an MVP. So we spent six months behind the scenes testing before we even took on our first client. And then even that first six, 12 months, we worked hard to... Um, to tell all our clients, hey, this is, we're changing the world here. This is, you know, n- a new approach. And everyone, because we're selling to, and we continue to fellow entrepreneurs, they were all for it. So it's been a great, great partnership story. How long has, how long ago did that happen? Well, did we, start- we did testing in, you know, 22 and 23, and then we, we officially launched late last year. Okay. So we've, okay. 
shooting for, you know, about 25, 30 manuscripts for this year, which is exceeding our expectations. So um, it's built to scale that you, we could do hundreds and hundreds a year. So, so looking back on that whole experience of putting the idea, the MVP together, minimal viable product, what was your biggest surprise? Um, the biggest surprise is that all the roadblocks that we thought we would run into, we ran into. We, we knew that we had to probably, even though we really believed in our <clears throat> initial um, product coding code, let's say, uh, we had to throw it away after three or four months. Um, so what we would have done a decade or two ago is been belligerent probably, or I know I would have, and I would have just kept trying, trying, trying. So I think that we had some tenured under our belt. We, we let's throw it away. There's always a new way of doing it. So it's just a lesson. So probably our appreciation for mistakes is off the chart. It's just data. It's we're agnostic about it. We don't get, not that we, you know, who wants to make mistakes, but you, you just do. I mean, that's part of starting a company. You know, it's the, the odds are against you from day one. So we just run, you know, run towards trying to solve any issues that we have and try not to make them again. When you put together a minimal viable product, you have an idea, you're going about it, you're testing it, refining it, testing it, refining it. How many iterations or what version of your product are you on today versus what you thought you would have when you were just starting out? I would say it's hard to quantify because it blends together, but mm -hmm. I would say we're probably on three, uh, but we're in a good spot. So I think the next iteration will be 3.1, 3.2 won't be, you know, whole, we won't be throwing everything away. A lot of it is also positioning and elevating some of the features more than others. Um, so it's, it's kind of a cake recipe. you just, you just to make it all work. You have to, Everything has to line up brand, positioning, pricing. And of course, the big one of all time is timing, you know, making sure you're ahead of the wave and not, um, you know, where the wave's going to crash and you, you have to stop what you're doing. Any scary encounters that you've experienced since the two of you put this idea together? Well, I have a sad encounter. Um, there was a third, really a third and fourth, um, uh, founder, let's say they weren't a founder, but they were an advisory board member. And normally I'm not a big proponent of advisory board, but, um, we were coming from a different area of publishing and I wanted to get into this nonfiction swim lane. And I had uh, someone very close to me who was, um, very instrumental in, um, in, in our company and he passed away suddenly. And that was just a couple of months ago or not, maybe not even that. And so that's just reality of life that, you know, punches you right in the face. And he was very valuable, like really, really valuable, not only as a friend, he's a, for, a former EO forum mate, uh, his wisdom, but just just his, his goodness and his lessons that he taught myself and lots of other people. So I, I mentioned that that's, that's a big one. And um, mm -hmm. first time that's happened to me, but, you know, it happens and you... You have to rally and you have to keep going. Yeah. So in your business career, what were some of the bigger challenges that you've experienced? Well, I have one, probably the biggest challenge is not trusting my gut instincts. Um, most of my companies have been self-funded, organic. Um, you know, you, gr you grow them and you take X amount of years and, and hopefully you exit or how, whatever the outcome is. And I've done that four or five times uh, to various degree. You know, some of them have not, you know, ended, I was happy it just ended. And some, it was a nice, really nice exit. And then I uh, have had a time where I went to kind of more of a, a larger partnership pool in a business, um, took venture capital money and re really used a script of others where I didn't depend on my intuition and instincts as much. I followed the game plan and the roadmap and blueprint. And, um, I found I, I, I work better, uh, when, when, you know, when I'm working with, with an, an idea I came up with 
and that my partner is fine failing forward, failing forward, failing forward. And if you're in a private equity situation or venture capital situation, failing forward isn't part of the vocabulary. And, and I get it. It's nothing against them. It's just um, I just learned my lesson that um, business for me is, again, I'll never use the term, but an iterative process. Many entrepreneurs, sometimes first time entrepreneur, not necessarily first time, they find the idea that everything, everything rests on your shoulders. There's not one part of the business in the beginning of a startup that doesn't rest on your shoulders. And that can create an awful lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure, a lot of uncertainty, and people have difficulty dealing with uncertainty sometimes. Have you ever experienced anything like that in any of your startups or your businesses? Every single one of them. Um, I, you know, follow the 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 uh, caricature of the entrepreneur of, you know, seven days a week, um, family stress, health stress, financial stress. I've you know, seen it all, and now that I've you know can take a little step back from you know from it, um, I would say I enjoyed every second. Um, but if I had to redo it, and I'm not a nostalgic person, I would say that there's probably been a little bit too much romanticizing about being an entrepreneur and that persona. And that um, just because you work so hard and wear that as a badge of honor, I don't think it should be worn as a badge of honor. I think you solve your problem, have great ethics, work really hard, but the health, the stress on family, um, I think there's, I don't know if I would make the argument, but I think there's a good argument that oftentimes it's not worth it. And that's, that's not often said, but, um, you know, I'll say. How did you find yourself in the entrepreneurial realm versus working for a bigger organization and looking for lifelong employment, et cetera? I had the proverbial one job that was for the big organization, really two. And as I tell younger entrepreneurs, and I might be wrong, but it's kind of probably my go-to because I really believe it because it happened to me, but maybe it's different for other people, is that the ideas will find you, the opportunity will find you. And so, you know, I had a period of time where I was working at the big company and I wanted to start a company, I thought, but there was no idea, there's no substance, there was no real problem solving um, of anything unique. I probably, I don't know if I thought of franchises, nothing wrong with that, but I probably thought of that, or I thought of just making a better mousetrap because I thought it would be really cool. But at a certain inflection point, there was a problem and there was a solution that I thought I uniquely could handle. And, um, and you know, the rest is history, but I, I think these kind of opportunities find you and then just be ready and, and uh, hopefully you have the financial wherewithal and time to make it happen. We talked just a moment ago about stress, anxiety, uncertainty, et cetera. I know I'm an entrepreneur since I'm in my early mid twenties. <laughs> uh, how do you manage stress and anxiety when you're at those points where you just feel that panic almost coming over you? So I'll give you the, the go-to and then the really transparent, um, the, the go-to is, is just what everyone else will say. And it's Mount Everest for an entrepreneur. Uh, but that is the exercise and the good sleep and the good eating, all those things. Uh, surrounding yourself with good people and not toxic people. And that includes employees. If you have a bad hire and that's constantly heartburn, you know, this, that, you know, your body doesn't know any difference. It's just another stress point. And, um, and it, you know, those things are really important to exercise, eat well, but also surround yourself with healthy people. Uh, but I, uh, this is fairly recent, uh, about five or six years ago, I noticed some traits that I was having that I wouldn't even tell my wife. I was just not happy with it. I was not able to complete some tasks uh, over a long period of time. I got in a car wreck and it was just a lot of weird stuff was happening. And I went just on my own and went to a doctor and, you know, I checked all the boxes for ADHD. And, um, you know, I, I was a late bloomer to that. I didn't have anything for or against it, but that has been life-changing for me. You know, I, I, it's 
life changing, but might not be life changing for everyone. But um, it it definitely helped me, you know, be how, more focused. How did it change your life? Um, well, I'll tell you what one little now to get really, you know, Oprah here for a second. I it's little things. I, I wasn't able to fold laundry at home if my wife threw me some laundry or something. It was I was just little things like this, just little things like that. And then I started noticing paying attention to my books and and at, at, at financial aspects and and um, I just wasn't my best self. So I it wasn't like oh let's let's go get a pill. It's let's go talk to some people, get some context, and then then you have to admit it. You have to be you know I have to admit it to my children and other people. And you know now I now I don't care and I'm happy I did it. But um, you know it's it's a book about meditation I think, but it's. It has nothing to do with meditation, but the analogy I would get, it makes you 10% better. And that's a metaphor. It's not like a cure-all. It's not, it's like exercise. It's, it's just 10% better, but I'll take a bunch of 10% and stack them on Absolutely. top of each other. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Dan, in our line of work with podcasts, we talk to an awful lot of business people and it's surprising to me how many people come out and they literally say, I have HD. ADHD or mm -hmm. um, OCD, something like that. And they never knew it and they got diagnosed mid late in life. And a lot of them are entrepreneurs. Yeah. So um, you and others are not alone. That's for sure in that yeah. area. Um, let's change the subject just a little, getting back to the publishing of um, content, stories, et cetera. What are your thoughts and concerns about uh, data privacy and security in the future? Uh, again, two 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 things can be true at the same time um one is that train already left i mean is it even can you even put that you know back in the bottle uh that every single thing i mean i was looking at my computer yesterday and all the cookies track and it, just even that level the text we're all getting that are hyper personalized you know that are um you know entering my cell phone that you know are nonsensical you know we're getting spammed constantly um i've had a bad in my business one bad episode of of um, getting hacked so i i guess i i'm not going to give you a great answer because i'm like wow it's just maybe it's just too late and you know you just take these little steps and you do the best you can regarding what we do um we're a little bit buffered from it because in ai it is this you know this open library of, of, you know, a lot of data points that go into that library with, with Claude and, uh, and open AI and so forth. We are on the back end currently using open AI. So we're on the back end and we, we have a, our own large language model that doesn't know the rest of the world. And specifically the author would have their own. So everything's kind of protected. So it's not bleeding over anywhere else, but we have files on our computers like anyone else. And, you know, things can, you know, go certain places, even though we try our best to mitigate and so forth. So it is a very big um, area of rigor for us, but I don't know if we'll ever be experts and be foolproof, but we're, we'll certainly give it a try. When you look at AI technology, I believe if I heard you correctly, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that you said even in the process that you're working on, the product that you're developing, if you will, the service and product, um, you don't even need an editor as much as you used to, given that AI can send you questions and help elaborate and become that dialogue partner with you. Where do you see that going in the future? Well, you, 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 do, not, you do need an editor. You just don't need them with maybe the rudimentary work, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, the wisdom, the context, the experience that an editor brings is more important than ever. Um, as far as where it's going, I mean, it's anybody's guess. Every time I listen to Sam Altman, you know, the founder of OpenAI, and Chet, I, you know, he seems vague. You know, it seems like everyone's vague and no one really knows. And a lot of reporters will ask what it's going to be like in 10 years and so forth. Um, I, I do know that I got into advertising. It was after, but I, I saw remnants of an old art director, maybe, maybe look at, uh, 
Mad Men, you know, when they used to paint the artwork and these were real artists and so forth. And then, um, then these creative tools, you know, came about that our directors now use and graphic designers now use, and they're all dependent on these, these new tools. Well, but, but we still call them artists and we still have great respect for graphic artists, uh, even though they use InDesign or some other tools. So I think it'll be the same. These are AI right now, or is like a co-pilot. It's an assistant. If you ask me, uh, if I listed the top 100 things that AI does, I, I wouldn't put writing in the top 100. I really wouldn't. I, it, it can. Sometimes it can do really pithy, interesting things. But it, it, it's so much better at organizing, finding gaps, and, and asking questions. Um, and that's how, that's my world. That's how we use it. So writing content is, you know, we have to stick to no plagiarism and, and attribution. So it's, we just don't look at it that way. So I just wanted to ask really good questions and organize and find gaps. That's what I'm, I'm looking at. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested if you could, the name chapters and given what you do, I think is a very creative, good brand of a name for a business. How'd you come up with that name? Well, I've been in business long enough and the hardest thing in the whole world. And I, I get ticks when someone is talking to me about coming up with the name of their company because it is hard. It is really, really. And I've had to come up with them. And when you get a good one, you're so lucky. This one fell in our lap it, and it was just serendipity because, again, it went back to kind of authenticity. Why do we exist? Kind of two reasons. And they're connected is one is to is to remove the friction and, and pressure and stress of writing a book to capture in someone's wisdom. The other one is just to capture um, the chapters of our life. So although we're doing executives and entrepreneurs down a lot of our books, we really love the legacy book. Um, that's end of life or grandmother, grandfather. We really want to capture everyone's story at every stage of life. So that's where, that's really the meaning. And whenever I get stuck, and it's weekly on something about our branding or positioning. I, I always go back to that name and just, okay, that, that serves as an anchor. So it's just chapters of your life. In my brain, that's how I look at that name every day. It's excellent. So, Dan, what, what do you see the future for chapters in yourself? Well, starting a company in this environment, running a company in this environment, wanting to scale, there's nothing really small about chapters. It's a lot of reasons it's really meant to scale. So M&A, alternative ways of funding, capital, those are really what's on my mind for 2025. So we are looking at um, growing, but just not organically. So we think there's an opportunity in this sector in the what's called hybrid publishing. So publishing is an FYI is four or five large companies like Random House, these, these companies you're, you're, we're all familiar with. And then there's this other category that we reside in called hybrid publishing. And there's 20 to 30 pretty good companies and they're probably, a hundred, probably 50 to 100 if you count all the small ones. We think there's a consolidation play um, and we think we can help those companies as kind of be their, the, the technology. So we're as Tesla is a technology company that makes cars. We're a technology company that helps people write books. We believe we could take our carburetor and put it in one of those companies. So we, we are really interested in uh, mergers and acquisition discussions uh, next year. Great. Dan, what's the best way for someone to get in contact with you should they want to talk to you? Yeah, great. So it's uh, Dan at chapters.io. So chapters, plural.io. Uh, Dan Chapters, you can look on LinkedIn and find me quickly there. And then our website is chapters.io. I would love to mm -hmm. talk to anyone, especially if they have a contrarian point of view, um, because we're always taking in data and different per perspectives. So if anyone's interested in talking about publishing, I'd love to chat. Okay, Dan, thank you very much for your time today. Interesting conversation. Interesting also to follow the, the course and the next uh, stages of your growth. Thank you very much. I'm grateful. Thank you. Take care. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. 
The Implementers Podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.